Welcome back everybody. Today we're going over this beautiful rifle that you see in front of me right now and that you guys saw me firing throughout the intro. Um, what it is, is it's the Brownells Proto Rifle, Proto being short for prototype. And uh, I'm not forgotten weapons. Ian over there does an excellent job at history, way better than I could ever do. And I'm sure he's already covered this. But what these are is uh, reproductions of some of the earliest AR-15s out there. Now, many of you guys know uh, Eugene Stoner, some of the earlier rifles, predating this were chambered in 308 or 7.62 by 5.1 and actually some other calibers as well. But when they were looking to scale it down to develop what would eventually become the M16A1, they basically kind of shrunk down the early uh, 308s that Armalite was making for um, the Sudan, Colombia, etc. contracts. And this is what you see here. It kind of looked like this. In fact, it looked a lot like this. And from what I understand, there was only three or four ever made. And uh, those, I believe, are still out there in circulation. I believe Reed Knight from Knight's Armament has one. And it's down there in the museum. And I'm sure there are others as well floating around. You guys who may know more about this, please let us know down below in the comment section. But there's a lot of really cool, unique features that go into what you see here. And we're going to walk through it here step by step. Starting here at the end, you'll see that we do have a three-pronged flash hider. It's what's commonly referred to as a duckbill style flash hider and would be correct for this rifle. Uh, some of the 601s had this as well as some of the early M16A1s before they transitioned to the traditional three-prong and then eventually the M16A1 closed uh, flash hider. But this one would be correct for this. Uh, continuing on back, you'll see that we do not have a crush washer like you would see on a normal AR-15 or M4 today. We have this little uh, slip ring here, which again would be correct for the rifle. So it's, again, you're going to see a lot of small details that go into this and make it kind of a cool little rifle here. So moving on back, the barrel itself is a 4150 20-inch barrel. It is M16A1 profile, so basically what we would consider today a pencil profile. It has a 1 in 12 twist. It has a chrome chamber, and it also is MP and HP tested. Now, I know a lot of folks out there are going to be concerned with the 1 in 12 twist. Um, I will tell you, I've shot this exact barrel, which is on my 601 for groups. If you guys go watch that video, you guys can see it. Uh, it definitely shoots two to three MOA. That's with my Mark I eyeball and no optics. So in terms of accuracy, it shoots very well. It's stabilized bullets uh, anywhere from 55 to 69 grain. And then beyond that, we started to see keyholing down there on the target for those of you guys who remember that video. So uh, for most of the stuff you're going to use that's just plinking ammo, like, uh, you know, your 855 or M193 or any sort of uh, variance thereof, it's going to run just fine and you guys don't have to worry about the twist rate. It'll stabilize it and it'll be accurate out to distance. We shot this particular one out to 400 yards and got hits with it pretty consistently even using the uh, 55 grain ammo which doesn't do so well in the wind. Either way we were able to do it. So the barrel itself is plenty accurate. A lot of cool stuff going on here with our front sight base. Um, these, again, were not produced for decades until Brownell started bringing these back. And basically what this is is a scaled down version, again, of their 308, that Armalite and the folks that Eugene Stoner in particular were developing. Um, you guys can see here it has a little bit of a different finish than the barrel, but it's very close to what the actual uh, real ones back in the day on the prototypes would have. It has an M16A1 front sight post, which I really like. For those who don't know, it has a little bit of a taper to it. And for me, I don't know why they ever changed that. They're just more accurate from a practical sense. For me, and I'm sure I'm not alone in that, it definitely gives you a smaller, more focused aiming point. And you can see a lot more around the target than you can with the uh, A2 and A4 type posts out there, M4 type posts out there. So this one here, uh, just for what it's worth, I had to go ahead and tighten it down a good bit or screw it down a good bit, I should say, to be able to zero it. Um, as you guys can see, it's sort of recessed in there, but we got it zeroed. And again, we were able to get hits pretty consistently. We do have our sling swivel on the bottom. There is no way to mount the bayonet. Again, that would be correct for this rifle as well. Continuing on back, we have a handguard retainer, which is round, again, correct for the prototype. And these handguards here are sort of a plasticky type of material. Uh, the original ones, from what I've seen and what I've heard, are kind of like a hybrid Bakelite, which isn't produced anymore. Um, so Ronald's did the best they could, and we have this brown polymer here. And uh, unlike some of the uh, early rifles that Brownells did in their prototype series, they actually have heat shields in them, which is nice um, because I got this one a little bit warm a couple times to test out a theory that we're going to get to here in just a second and had no issues with heat or anything like that coming out of the handguard. You can see they have ventilation holes there at the 3, 6, and 12 o'clock positions. So it does cool down fine, and it's nice and skinny. For those of you guys who like to C-clamp your rifles, that one will feel right at home to you. 
Continuing on back, we get into another one of those cool small things that they got right here. And we see that the handguard retainer does not have an angle to it like traditional modern ones would have. It has the old school straight design and this one here also has sort of a gray parkerized finish to it. All of that would be period correct for this rifle. Uh, one of the very cool things that Brownells was able to do is this little guy right here, if I can actually drop it without looking at it, is our 25 round magazine. This is a steel magazine and uh, it's period correct for these prototype rifles. Now, from what I understand, none of these ever made it into circulation. Of course, early adopted uh, versions of the M16 had the 20 round magazines. And the reason for that was that these 25 round designs simply weren't all that reliable, um, at least not when fully loaded. So again, the capacity is stated to be 25 rounds. If you guys want to use it and have good reliability with it, Brownells recommends loading about 22 to 23 rounds to it. And there's a reason that the more than 20 round magazine started to have a curve to it. And that's exactly why this one had some issues feeding when fully loaded. But it's very cool that Brownells went out of the way to make these magazines, which haven't, again, been in production for decades. Uh, Brownells does make a ton of magazines for those that don't know, uh, particularly for the AR-15. So good on them for using that skill and tooling capacity to make those suckers, because I'm sure they had to go through a lot of work and R&D to get these to work. So uh, for what it's worth, we had zero malfunctions using these, but I did only load them to 23 rounds. All right, we have our A1 style carry handle here. Uh, we have two peep sights at the rear for day and night shooting. And that again, period correct for the rifle. Our windage elevation adjustment knob here on the side of our carry handle is going to be A1. So uh, you can buy an A1 adjustment tool if you guys don't have one. They're out there. They're fairly common. I think they're like 12 bucks. However, if you want to just use a bullet like I did when I was in basic training many years ago, uh, you can do that and it works just fine. That's what I did here on this one as well. On that note, I should also mention that the front sight, the M16A1 front sight, is five has five prongs. So if you guys are used to a traditional uh, modern AR adjustment tool that has four prongs on it, you have to have one with five. However, again, you can use a bullet tip if you want to. I'm sure your drill sergeant said not to, but trust me, it works. You can see here on the safety selector lever that it is only on the left side of the rifle. And over here on the right side, you'll see no tick marks. So that's one thing. Again, small details that they really went out of their way to make and Brownells is actually getting these parts made and they haven't been made again in decades. So to get the safety selector without the tick mark, one of those cool things indeed. Our lower receiver here does not have the fencing. It's an M16A1 style lower. Uh, again, period correct for this particular rifle as is our dust cover. Now, when the Brownells Retro Series first came out, they were using standard, you know, M16A2, M4 type dust covers. However, Brownells went through the trouble to get these ones made again, have not been made in decades. You probably going to hear me say that a lot throughout this video, but it's very cool in my opinion, just the small little things on there. So uh, we have the plus mark again, period correct, no fencing, um, which would have allowed the front pin to be retained. It's not retained as you'll see here when we take it apart. And there's really nothing protecting your mag catch there either. So should you accidentally bump it, your mag's probably going to drop. So there's reasons that they changed these things over the years, guys. Uh, continuing on back here on the upper receiver, you'll see that there is no shell deflector. And there's already a bunch of brass marks there where I've scuffed it up. Some of you guys that are really into keeping your rifles in pristine condition might want to put some tape over that because the brass will hit there. So if you're a left-handed shooter and you don't want brass to the face, might not be the rifle for you, or you might just want to shoot it right-handed. Another thing I'm sure a lot of you guys noticed here is the charging handle. So the charging handle is up here underneath our carry handle. That's the way these would have been back then as well. And uh, that's how you charge it. One thing I'll tell you is that compared to a regular charging handle, you have to have a little bit more force to overcome it briefly, just when it first starts out. After that, it's very simple. But the reason for that is there's a couple detents here in our charging handle. And this was changed for a couple reasons from what I've heard. Um, again, they obviously eventually went away with the A2 or A1 style carry handle. Um, but some folks reported that after a high round count, these would get hot. Um, I dumped Magpul D60s through this twice and uh, I didn't notice that. I didn't notice it being very hot. However, 60 rounds really isn't like a torture test or anything like that. Maybe if you put 100 or so through there, it might get hot. But again, I didn't notice it there at all. Disassembly the rifle, pretty standard. Our rear uh, takedown pin is captive. Um, so at this point, we're gonna go ahead and pull this sucker back. Had to be careful there. And we're gonna pull out our bolt carrier group and your charging handle kind of has to go down. 
like so to come out. And back here we had this spring system here and that's what you're having to overcome when you first start pulling on the charging handle to cycle the action. So our front takedown pin here has a detent mark in it, which again would have been correct for the rifle and uh, it's flat on the side as well rather than the current rounded ones. Again, it comes right out. So if you can imagine soldiers in the field having to do maintenance on the rifles, that's probably suboptimal. So uh, that's one of many reasons I'm sure that was changed. So looking at the upper receiver and the lower receiver, these have sort of a parkerized gray finish, sort of purplish finish to them. Again, period correct. So earlier, uh, Brownells retro rifles had sort of a modern black finish to them. That would not have been correct for these. Um, a lot of people will describe it as a gray finish, and that's true. It does look gray depending on the light, but it can also have sort of a purplish hue if it's in bright sunlight. Uh, looking in there, we do not have M4 feed ramps. Again, back then there was no such thing as M4 feed ramps. Those didn't come around for decades. So again, period correct. And I should also point out that our upper receiver has that slot cut in there. So Brownells is having these manufactured specifically for these rifles. Um, so again, a lot of cost, a lot of research and development went into that and good on them for that. Again, we have our A1 style rear receiver here. We have our flat trigger guard and the trigger on this one is basic mil spec. So nothing to write home about, um, but it works just fine. Breaks clean right around six pounds. So good on them for that. Our release here and catch bolt catch is also M16A1 correct, which is also prototype correct. Uh, it's different than the current ones. It's a little bit harder to use and a little bit harder to actuate both to close the bolt and to lock it there, uh, lock it to the rear rather. So you can definitely see why they changed it over the years. But again, very cool in that regard. The actual pistol grip itself is M16A1 style, nothing wrong with it at all. In fact, I prefer it over the A2 style because there's no finger bump that's not gonna line up to your hands. Our buttstock here is M16A1 length. Again, we have the brown coloration on there. We do not have a trap door for any sort of uh, cleaning kits or anything like that. That was not the way it was back then. We have a polymer finish on there with some ribbed cuts. And then down here on the bottom, we have our sling swivel point. And you guys can see, these are not your typical A1 stocks. It actually has the pin put in there uh, specifically for the clone style rifles. So very cool in that regard. The prototype rifles, as well as the 601 that followed, had an all chrome bolt carrier group like you see here. Of course, the carrier itself is made out of 8620 steel, has a full auto profile. And for those who don't know what that is, it means this little piece back here is larger so that way it can trip and auto sear. Um, and then we have good staking here on the gas key. Our bolt here is MP tested. Now the original ones probably had Carpenter 158 steel. This one here is a 9310 um, that Brownells makes. And you guys can see as well that we do not have any forward serration cuts on there because the actual upper receiver, if you didn't notice it already, doesn't have a forward assist either. Reassembly the rifle is pretty straightforward. The big difference of course is gonna be with that charging handle. You wanna drop it in and then get it down there in that groove and kind of push it forward to get started. Bolt carrier group, you're gonna make sure your bolt is extended. Push that sucker home there. At this point, we're gonna mate our upper and our lower receiver and make sure we don't lose our non-captive uh, takedown pin. And that's it, you're back and ready to go. I know I already alluded to it, but this rifle that you see in front of you now is the Brownells BRN-10. It is a clone of some of the Portuguese and Sudanese AR-10s that originally went out in some of the first contracts. And as you guys can see, looking at it, this rifle here really is basically a scaled down version of it. Now again, Brownells wasn't looking to actually make a copy or a smaller version of this. They were looking to make something uh, very similar to the early prototype rifles, which I think they did a great job at. And uh, the details that Brownells continues to get right as the retro series moves along really is cool. Um, it's a great shooting rifle. My father was actually out shooting with me yesterday and uh, we were shooting this rifle here. We had a bunch of modern guns out there and this was the one he liked the most. Um, he entered the military sort of as Vietnam was winding down and he joined the army and uh, they had M16A1s back then. And he said he just loves the sights for him. They're intuitive and very easy to use. And I actually think that's true even for anyone today, uh, particularly if you're looking for accuracy, they just shoot really, really well um, and enable the shooter to be accurate, provided you can actually see well enough to use them. But yeah, he was a big fan of it and I am too. Um, I love 20 inch ARs, everybody love, knows that. I like lightweight uh, ARs, I think that's pretty much universal. And uh, this one here with the, what we would call today a pencil profile, however, uh, what they would call a uh, M16A1 profile, 
is super handy, super lightweight, and can do a ton of things. I would imagine most folks looking into this are kind of looking into it as a collector piece or as something that's a fun range gun. But if you wanted to use it for serious use, I mean, it's definitely up to the task. Uh, very reliable. Uh, we've had zero malfunctions out of this rifle to date. The majority of what we put through it have been uh, M193 uh, Winchester stuff from LAX ammo and uh, just about 600 rounds at this point. Zero issues at all. Nothing to complain about. So we ran it with uh, modern mags as well as the retro mag as well as some of the 20 rounders that you guys have probably seen throughout the video and it just keeps going and asking for more. So performance wise, there's absolutely nothing uh, to be upset about in my opinion. Price wise, some of you guys might be upset about it, but it's not terrible. Uh, believe me, if you're looking to buy one of those four that's out there, it would be astronomically higher than what I'm about to tell you. But this rifle right now, as I'm filming this video, is on sale for $1,199 over at Brownells. If you guys aren't following me at Facebook or signed up for my email list, I definitely recommend you do one or the other uh, because I always uh, send out, well, emails I do once a week uh, with the deals of the week. And oftentimes these are these can be had rather even a little bit lower than that. And uh, over on my Facebook page, I'm always posting good deals to this and many other things that you guys see here on the channel. Um, so definitely check it out. And I think the price is pretty good for what uh, you get here. I mean, just think of all the different parts on this rifle that Brownells had to invest in the tooling, pay people, uh, pay machinists, etc., to make, or you know, stamp houses or whatever the case may be, depending on the actual part. And uh, for what you get here in terms of a cool factor as well as a quality rifle, um, I think the price is fair in my opinion. I, I'm, I'm not mad about it at all. If you guys have any questions about this rifle, by all means, post down below in the comments section. As always, I look forward to it. However, if you actually need an answer for me, from me, rather, uh, the best place to get me is over at my Facebook page that I previously mentioned. Um, I do answer all the messages I get over there, at least the ones I see. So if you have a bunch of curse words in there, I might not see it because it gets filtered out. But all the ones I see, which is 99.9% .9 of them, I do get back to you guys on. So that's the best place to reach me should you need to do so. But as always, guys, thanks for watching. Thanks for subscribing. If you're not subscribed, please go ahead and hit that subscribe button. Even if you are subscribed, please go ahead and hit the notification bell because I realize a lot of you guys aren't seeing my videos unless you do that. So that's pretty much it, guys. Again, thanks for watching. I truly appreciate it. And I hope to see all of you in the next video.